Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to present this work. This is uh, joined with David Argente, Sara Moreira, and Anthony Priolo. Um, this is still a work in progress, so we're super happy to hear any uh, feedback uh, that you may have. So next slide. Okay, I have to give these two disclaimers, one for uh, the Federal Reserve and the other for Nielsen. So next slide. Okay, so uh, we're motivated in this paper by uh, a question that I don't think needs any explanation. You know, firm, we all know that firms are born small, they grow and they die. And we want to know as economists, uh, what explains this process. So in this paper, we dig into an explanation that's based on demand. Okay, so the first thing that we do is uh, we use uh, retail scanner data and advertising data on consumer food to show that entering firms in the consumer food sector uh, grow in, in three different ways. First of all, uh, they add new geographical markets. Second of all, they build market share in their continuing markets, and they do so without changing their markups. And third, they use advertising to generate sales uh, within markets. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, we use a model together with these facts. Uh, so this is going to be a structural model where firms grow through marketing and advertising. And we use this model to back out what is the distribution of intrinsic heterogeneity across firms. Then um, we, we use this to show that the variance in firm size on entry is actually so that firm size measured by, by, by sales or revenue is six times uh, the variance of intrinsic heterogeneity. And we conclude from that, that demand frictions play an important role in magnifying uh, cross firm differences. So in magnifying you know, firm, the difference between firms that might be relatively similar in terms of their intrinsic characteristics, demand frictions mean that uh, these two firms may end up having very different sizes. And then something, sorry, just uh, something that we're working on, but we haven't uh, uh, yet got something to say is uh, we're working on what is the contribution of endogenous demand. So demand that firms accumulate uh, by entering new markets and by using uh, uh, non-price uh, actions to uh, sort of accumulate demand within markets. So we want to back out what is the contribution of those channels to firm growth, and that's something that uh, we're working on. So first I'm gonna give you some important facts uh, about the data before you know, talking about the, the, the three main uh, things that we're, we're, we're gonna show using these data. So uh, we make use of two uh, data sets uh, in our main analysis. So the first data set is Nielsen retail scanner data, uh, which we have uh, for uh, 12 years. Okay, so uh, this, this is some data that, you know, a lot of people have been using recently and, you know, I'm not sure whether this is available for other countries, but I think it would be super interesting if, if it were. So what we have is weekly data on sales value and volume at the store uh, UPC or the store barcode level. So that's kind of the fundamental uh, data uh, that we, we get. We also know, so this is, you know, Nielsen is basically monitoring uh, 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 a large share of groceries, so about 50% of grocery stores in the US and, you know, 30% of, of uh, retailers like uh, big box retailers like Target um, and 30% of drug stores. And so then that allows them to collect these weekly data on sales value and volume uh, at, the, at the store barcode level. Um, we also know uh, in this data uh, a Nielsen uh, product module. Uh, we know the brand that's associated with uh, the barcode. We know where the store is located, um, you know, in what uh, zip code, and we know what uh, store chain it's associated with. Um, so these data cover, um, as I say, 50% of grocery store uh, sales in, in the US. And we've worked out that they cover about 16% of food and beverage uh, pur purchases for consumption uh, off-site. Um, 
based on using national income accounts data. So there's a sort of a pretty, pretty good coverage. Um, and then we use another data set to match uh, barcodes, to match UPCs to firms. So when we talk about firms, um, that's what we're going to be, uh, that's the data that we're going to be using to, to uh, make that call on what is a firm. And we're going to focus, uh, you know, Nielsen covers, as I say, a bunch of different types of stores and a bunch of different types of products. We're going to focus on food. And there's an important reason for focusing on food. And that is that uh, uh, for, for food markets uh, in this period are, so geographically uh, markets are segmented. So if I want to buy eggs or milk or uh, uh, vegetables, uh, I'm not going to be ordering those online so that sort of I can think about a geographical region as being um, a market. And if consumers in a particular uh, and I, I sort of uh, sell to consumers in a new geographical region, I know that those are new consumers. The second set of data that we make use of, and this is sort of one of the real uh, innovations of the project, is uh, we use Nielsen data on advertising. So this is a data set which is available for uh, eight of the years in our retail scanner um, panel, where um, Nielsen monitors a whole bunch of different media on advertising, but its main uh, sort of the main medium which it monitors, or the sort of the most important medium which it monitors, is TV. Um, so it monitors in order to sort of uh, 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 know what programs, uh, you know, who's watching what programs and in what numbers, which then allows uh, uh, sort of TV uh, to, uh, you know, set prices for for advertising. Um, so what we're interested in is that they uh, monitor, um, you know, who's advertising, um, uh, in what uh, regional market are they advertising, um, and what are they advertising. So we construct um, uh, uh, crosswalks at the product and the brand level so that we can match up um, these advertising data um, to the retail scanner data. We can also match at the level of the the market, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, in a few slides. Um, as I said, Nielsen does does monitor advertising in other media, but we focus on local TV, where they basically monitor in in uh, all of the geographical markets uh, in the U.S. and sort of their technology for monitoring is 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 the best. Um, so six percent of the brand products in the scanner data. Uh, end up advertising on local TV. Um, so that fraction may not seem very large, but that accounts for 45% of the value in the retail scanner data. Um, so those are our two main uh, data sources. We also do um, robustness using, Nielsen also has a household panel where, you know, they put a little scanner uh, uh, in your home and every time you purchase, um, you scan those items. And that allows Nielsen to capture uh, purchases at stores that they don't monitor. Um, we make use of IRI is another Nielsen-like um, uh, uh, company that uh, also sort of monitors sales in stores. And, uh, you know, we don't just uh, look at, at uh, local TV advertising. We also uh, look at other media. So next slide. Can I ask a, yes. a short question? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you already said this, or maybe you're going to say this now. Uh, do you are you are you, are you treating firms as as establishments or 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 not? And how do you think establishments versus firms can sort of change uh, um, uh, the implications or the conclusions you get in terms of uh, growth um, over time? So here we don't know establishments, so we don't know where geographically uh, a product, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a particular observation was, say, a UPC was produced. We know the sort of the match is at the level of uh, who applied for the UPC. So uh, that's going to be, uh, I don't know, think about uh, Coke. Um, you know, Coke applies for the UPC. Coke has bottling uh, plants in different locations. We don't know if I see uh, uh, Coke uh, sales in, you know, my local grocery store in Minneapolis. I don't know which bottling plant that comes comes from. Uh, 
So I will mention how that affects um, how you should interpret uh, what we do um, uh, in, in, in a while when I sort of come to that. But yes, okay. so this is aggregating over plants um, within, within a firm. Okay, okay. so yeah, does, does that answer your, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess this is you're going to be capturing mostly like growth of the distribution and not growth of the production of the of the goods. Exactly. Um, I mean, in the background, you know, production has to grow in order for sales yeah. to grow. But we and we will be able to infer something about that. But we're really focusing on the demand side. I'll just you know open a parenthesis here and 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 say I have uh, other work using customs data. Um, which generates facts which look very similar to these facts. And there we are able to match uh, two establishments. Um, so what, I, what I'm showing you here, I don't think that the sort of, is it establishments or is it firms? Is, uh, this is something that, that is true uh, irrespective of the unit of analysis uh, that, that you're going to look at. Okay. Okay, so a little bit uh, more deep. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mario Gonzalez, uh, is regarding the database and how the data is collected. Um, I remember that uh, the, basically the question is: Does the customer has to fill out uh, the data, or it's something that Nielsen does from the retailer itself? Do you have any clue about that? Yes. And so if that is, does it have any, any effect on? The results. Okay, so at our main, Nielsen does two things. They have the retail scanner data, where they basically, you know, let's say my local grocery store uh, is uh, called Kowalski's. Um, Kowalski's, suppose they're a Nielsen store, they're monitored by Nielsen. You know, at the end of the week, they send them a data set which consists of um, all the UPCs, um, what is the value. And the volume, the quantity that they sold in a week. Okay, so that doesn't tell me anything about, you know, who bought what. It just tells me what is the total amount that was sold in that store in that week. Okay, so that's our main data source. And we like that because it covers 50% of, you know, grocery stores in grocery store sales in the US. So when I want to think about entry, having a good coverage. Is sort of important for you know. Do I see the product being sold? Um, if I don't see it being sold, I'm going to infer something about whether the product is sold at all. Um, having a good coverage there is important. There's a second data set that Nielsen has that we use in a subsidiary analysis, uh, where they um, monitor at the customer level. So there, I would have a little device in my home, and every product that I purchase, I should scan that product. Um, scan that barcode into the little machine, uh, and then sort of they they collect that data from me. So that data is attached to my purchases um, of you know what products did I purchase and how much did I spend on those. Um, it turns out we find very similar results using the two data sets, and I will show you that. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't matter um, which we use. Okay, thank you. Because my first impression was that the second type would be like less reliable. Because I also think that they they should fill in the price that they pay for that and the quantity. So it's like very mm, a lot of work for the customer at the end of the day. Right. I think they now have machines where if there's a barcode, it's sort of easier for them to then they can retrieve the price from the store that you bought it from. There's kind of things that make it easier, but there are some issues. Some reasons where the household panel would be better, and other things where the retail scanner would be better. So, okay, I'll talk more about those as we go on. But, but, uh, but it's for us, it's it's nice that we get the same results irrespective oh, yeah. of which data yeah, we definitely. use. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay, so a couple of uh, uh, definitions that are going to be important going forward. So, I'm going to talk about products. So, what is a product? Um, so, uh, a product. Um, Nielsen defined, Nielsen calls it a product module. So that's the most disaggregated level at which we can compare across different brands and firms. So 
there are 603 distinct food product modules um, in the data. And an example of these is yogurt or mozzarella cheese. These are the types of, these are pretty disaggregated uh, uh, products. Um, so when I refer to a product, that's what I'm going to be talking about. What is a brand? Um, a brand is a Nielsen defined aggregate of barcodes. And there are 50, more than 50,000 distinct brands uh, in uh, these data. So some examples of yogurt brands are Yople, Chobani, and Danone. These are, these are uh, distinct uh, uh, brands in the data. Okay, so what are firms? Um, so firms are going to be collections of products and brands. And there are, as I said, these are, uh, we see these by matching UPCs to who applied for the UPC, who applied for the barcode uh, using this other data set called GS1. Um, based on this uh, 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 data set, there are more than 20,000 distinct firms in our sample. So some examples here are General Mills, uh, which owns Yople, uh, Chobani, which owns Chobani, and Danone, uh, which owns Danone um, here. So firms uh, may have multiple products, and within a product, they may have multiple brands. Um, so those are sort of, that's what we're, we're talking about in this data. Okay, next slide. Okay, what is a market? So again, I'm going to refer to markets. A market is going to be um, a Nielsen DMA. So a DMA is a media market that is Nielsen defined. Okay, so you know, if I were to sell a TV ad, I sell it in a media market. Um, and I, there's a price for you know, running a, 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 an ad of a certain length in certain programs in, that may vary across media markets, depending on you know, how many uh, viewers there are in the different media markets. So why do we use these media markets? I mean, you can see from the picture that there are, um, you know, these are geographic regions which are you know, likely to be segmented from a consumer perspective, um, but we use these rather than say the more, more usual commuting zones or you know, counties, uh, because this facilitates a match between the retail scanner data and the advertising data. So our definition of a market is going to be the same um, when we're looking at uh, sort of sales, prices, quantities, as when we're using uh, data on advertising. Okay. And there are 210 of these in the data. Okay, one more definition. Um, and, well, not two more definitions. Okay, so the next definition, next slide. What is an entrant? So we're going to define entrance. So an entering firm, for example, is a firm that has sales in a given year, but not in the previous year. Okay. Um, based on this definition, we see on average um, uh, uh, a thousand uh, entrants uh, per year. Um, so that's about 8% of all the firms that we see in any given cross-section are firms that did not sell uh, anywhere or anything anywhere in, in the US in the previous year. Um, we can also make it, we use a similar, similar definition at the firm market or at the firm brand product market level. Um, and you can see that, you know, uh, 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 there are a lot, there is a lot of entry based on this definition in the data. Um, we're doing some robustness as regards this definition, uh, but I don't think it's going to change things too much. Okay, so can I can I yeah. ask you something? So going back to what we were talking before, so so how do you deal with M and A's here? Like if the Coca Cola company buys, um, you know, another drink, um, would you consider that to be a part of the same firm if they don't change the name of the product and the or, 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 or not? That's a good question. So uh, that's something that we need to work on. Uh, in the GS1 data, we can see when firms get swallowed up by other firms. Ideally, uh, I, yeah, I, we have to think about how we want to deal with this. My understanding is, so I haven't, uh, 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 I'm not the person who's worked exactly on this uh, GS1 match, that this is not sort of a super big deal in these data. But this, that's a really good question. That's something we need to work on. So right now, we just we have this GS1, and we they have a definition of who's a firm, and we use that 
uh, to match up, but we need to go back and look at that. Okay. That wouldn't affect entry at the level of individual brands, but it will affect entry definitions of entry at the, at the firm level. Okay, next slide. Okay, so one last set of definitions. Okay, so this is some terminology that I'm going to be using. So if you look at the, so this is, this is just an example uh, in the table. Suppose I had data from 2006 through 2013. And suppose, you know, I can let these A through H, suppose, for example, that they're firms. Let the X denote uh, a, a positive observation of sales. So I'm going to call a spell a continuous episode of sales. So an unbroken episode of sales. So think about uh, firm E. So firm E has two spells. There's 2007 and there's 2009 through 2010. Um, all the other uh, sort of examples in this table have one spell. We're actually going to be focusing on first spells. So at the firm level, that's not a big deal. Uh, or sorry, that, that isn't important. Most of there's very little re-entry um, uh, that we observe. Um, but I'm going to be use the terminology terminology of spells both when I talk about firms and when I talk about you know the firm market level. So an episode, a continuous episode of sales of a particular firm, let's say in markets A through H. Again, these would be spells. Uh, another piece of terminology, I'm going to uh, refer to the length of a completed spell as its duration. So think, for example, of firm C. Okay, so that's a spell which has duration of five. So it lasts for five years. I see entry and I see exit. So I know what the completed length of that spell is. Think about firm B. There, I actually don't know the duration. The duration is censored because the last year that I observe is 2013 and the firm sells in that year. So I don't know how long that spell lasts. Um, we're gonna to use top coding. Um, so I know that spell, uh, the spell of firm B lasts at least, um, what do I, at least seven years. So we're gonna to top code at a certain level where we're gonna make, be able to make use of information on the duration of, of spells where the exit is censored. Um, a third piece of terminology, we're going to refer to the current age of the spell, which is always less than or equal to its duration, as tenure. So think about, uh, again, firm C. You know, in 2008, it has tenure of one. In 2009, it has tenure of two. In 2010, it has tenure of three, and so on. Okay, so those are three pieces of terminology, spell, duration, and tenure that we're going to make use of. So any questions on that? Because that's important to be clear. Um, okay, good. So next, next slide. So our reduced, you know, we have two parts to the paper. There's this reduced form analysis where we document a set of facts, and then there's going to be the model um, where we use the model as a lens through which uh, to view the facts. Okay, so the three facts um, that we document. So the first of all is that uh, entering firms grow by adding new geographical markets. And this is something, you know, I have a background in international trade. This is not surprising, um, but, you know, we show that for firms within the US, uh, this is uh, a big deal. So next slide. Here's an example, okay? So here's a firm. For argument's sake, let's call it, I don't know, Chobani. Um, so this is a firm that uh, starts in 2007 selling uh, in the New York uh, uh, DMA, the New York uh, uh, media market. Uh, in 2008, it expands uh, along the eastern uh, seaboard and to some, um, uh, uh, media, uh, some media markets uh, in, the, uh, in the heartland. Um, 2009, it expands further into the Midwest and uh, to the uh, uh, West Coast. By 2010, it's basically covered most of uh, the DMAs uh, in the US. Uh, and by 2011, it's selling everywhere apart from, you know, this uh, small media market in the top corner of Maine. Uh, 2012, the same. And then by 2013, it sells in all the media markets uh, in the US. So this is an example of uh, a firm that sort of expands geographically, that adds markets uh, in sequence. Um, and 
we want to um, sort of do something systematic to characterize uh, this process. So on the next slide, I explain how, how we do this. So the way we sort of uh, characterize how this happens on average is by regressing the log of the number of markets, so the number of DMAs or media markets uh, in which a firm sells um, on some fixed effects and uh, 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 a sort of a rich set of interactions, a non-parametric uh, set of interactions uh, between indicators for duration of the spell, the firm spell, and tenure, the number of years um, that that spell has lasted uh, to date. So you want to think about this, we regress uh, this uh, uh, log of the number of markets on a year fixed effect. Um, I like to think about this, suppose I took exponentials and brought that year effect underneath. Um, you know, there's some years where uh, everybody sells in more markets. Um, we also have a cohort fixed effect, uh, sort of the entry year of the firm fixed effect. There are some entry years where everybody starts off selling in more markets, so we control for that. And then we have this uh, vector of interactions between duration and tenure, which allow us to characterize how the number of markets evolves um, within spells of, that last, uh, that have different durations. Uh, so now I can sort of talk about the, the figure, which, which uh, shows, go back, sorry, go back. Um, which uh, talk, Lauren? Yes. Uh, one quick question. Um, maybe you already said this, but I, so I was a little bit surprised by the previous slide, the one mm -hmm. with the uh, geographical Mm -hmm. uh, with the maps. Mm -hmm. so, so are these like sales directly to customers or through retailers like Walmart or stuff like that? So these are these are sales in, in retail chains. So is there is there a store that uh, has positive sales of uh, 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 brands and products that this firm sells? Okay. So this this particular uh, analysis doesn't show you what's happening at the level of individual consumers. And one thing that you can see in this picture, I mean, sort of one one feature that shows up is the fact that uh, re you sort of enter a market by entering retail chains that sell in a market, and those retail chains have a certain geographical distribution. One important thing to note about that uh, is that just because I sell in a retail chain doesn't mean I sell in all the markets where that retail chain has stores. So on average, um, placing a product in a retail chain, let's say that's basically a national chain, a chain that has stores in 150 or more of the 210 markets, most sort of the average uh, firm that place, that sells a product in the at store for the first time sells in only 15% of the markets where that chain has stores. So there right. is a sense in which the geographic distribution of where you sell is determined by placing your product in chains which have a geographic distribution. But just because you place your product in those chains doesn't mean you get to sell in all the markets um, where uh, the chain has stores. Now, we have gone back and forth between thinking about is the chain the market for the manufacturer or is the customer the market for the manufacturer? Um, right. We're going to do everything at the level of the, uh, the media market because we want to match up with advertising. But I will also uh, show you some facts about where we use the chain rather than the media market as the unit of analysis. And our conclusions are pretty similar or basically identical when we do that. So. Right, I, I understand. Thank you. So, um, so, so basically, firms are not building like a distribution network or something like that. Like, I mean, your your story is completely on the demand side. Um, well, so they they I, that, that that I would say maybe I didn't communicate correctly. I think they are build, building a distribution network, and that is they're placing their products in chains in stores, and so. There, I'm going to think about it that there are actions that firms need to take, which are costly for them uh, in order to place their products in stores. So that I need to, you know, convince the store to run my product because they have <coughs> valuable shelf space 
Um, why are they going to run a new product which might not sell and takes up space that could be occupied by products that are high selling? I have to convince the store or the chain to do that. That's costly for me. Um, and that's sort of part of the distribution um, uh, uh, investment that uh, 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 manufacturers are going to make. But is that so? Sorry if I uh, ask uh, a follow up on that. Mm -hmm. Is that a decision that the manufacturing is making, or is that a decision that the retailer is making? And, and, and the retailer is just making all those decisions and sort of a, and, and maybe also incorporating all of the costs of the distribution, and maybe there's a pass through of that to the manufacturer, but all the decision making is really being done at the retailer level. Okay, so I don't know for sure uh, who's making the decisions. I do know who is making the decisions on advertising. So that's the manufacturer who's making the decisions on advertising. I'm going to show you some facts about that and show you some facts about the relationship between stores and advertising. My, my, my guess is that these are actions that the manufacturer is taking, that it's not that stores go out necessarily looking for new products. It's that products go out and look for stores. Uh, that firms go out and, and look for stores. There's kind of anecdotal evidence from the um, marketing literature, you know, that you need to make payments in or to stores, to chains, in order to have your product get a premium placement in the store. Um, and that's going to be something where there's certainly a component of, of the, 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 the costs are borne by the manufacturer, but I don't observe that. I'm going to show you what I do observe. Um, my guess is that there's there's definitely uh, effort on the part of the manufacturers um, and you can sort of see from the evidence whether you think that that's a, a convincing story. Okay, so next slide. Just sorry, one, one quick question about that. So, so firms are building customer capital. It's, mm -hmm. it's not physical capital in yes. any way. Yes, in this, in this story. Okay. I'm not in the background. They may be doing something with physical capital, but this I'm going to be telling you about the efforts they're taking to build customer capital and showing you that there appear to be some frictions there. Um, that it takes them time to grow big, and these frictions seem to be important. Thank you. Okay. So, so again, I'm regressing the log of the number of markets um, on this uh, vector of interactions. So the sort of key uh, estimates from this equation are these uh, betas. And so by taking the exponential of these betas, I can draw the following picture. So on the x-axis is tenure. So the number of years that uh, the firm has been uh, selling anywhere. Um, and on the y-axis is the number of markets where the firm has been selling, where I normalize the number of markets to be equal to one in the first year of uh, a spell, so a firm uh, uh, a continuous episode of sales that lasts at least five years. Okay, so these are the unit of analysis here is going to be the year. Um, so two facts to take away um, from this picture. First of all, um, the uh, uh, there is a, 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 a monotonic relationship between the number of markets that a firm sells in, in its entry year and survival. Okay, so firms that survive longer sell in more markets on entry. Okay, second fact to take away from this is for firms that survive at least five years, uh, the number of markets they sell in after four years is 50% greater on average than the number of markets they sell in in their entry year. Okay, so that uh, uh, tells us something about the importance of growth th through entering new markets in firm growth. It also tells us something, you know, the dispersion uh, on number of markets on entry tells us something about sort of underlying heterogeneity across firms. Okay, so next slide. Um, so sort of the first fact is that entering firms grow by adding new geographical markets, as I just said. The number of markets uh, grows by 50% in the first four years. We also show um, that the number of markets accounts for a large fraction of the variance in entrance size. So where entrance size is measured by uh, uh, revenue, um, depending on how you allocate the covariance between number of markets and average sales per market. 
um, uh, the number of markets accounts for between 25 and 40 percent of ver the variance in entrance size. So in the cross section, sort of the number of markets is 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 important in accounting uh, uh, for entrance size. And then for uh, firms that survive at least uh, five years, markets that they add since the entry year, so new markets, you know, not counting the markets they have in their first year, um, new markets account for 30% of revenue after four years. So uh, uh, sort of the number of markets is important both in accounting for uh, dispersion in firm size in the cross section and also for firm growth. So now I'm going to move on to the second fact, which is that firms build market share in continuing markets without changing their markets. Next slide. Okay, so here I'm going to just take time to talk about some alternative. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I was thinking about the previous fact. So, so mm -hmm. do you in, in this growth of markets, do you see that they are growing like? with the same products that they started with, or this is also a, a feature of the expansion of the number of products that they're selling? Okay, so the facts that I showed you were all based only on the products and brands that the firm has in its entry year. I see. Okay? Firms also grow by adding products and brands, but for early stage entrants, so for entrants up to say year five, uh, the dimension of adding markets is much more important, is, you know, three times more important than the dimension of adding products. Okay, so products in this case is defined as a product module. Do I expand from yogurt to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, milk or something like that? Uh, so that dimension of adding products in the early years uh, is much less important than the dimension of adding markets. But the facts that I showed you are conditioning on the same set of uh, products and brands that the firm has in its entry year. Okay. okay. Thanks. So next slide. So I just want to talk about um, some alternative potential theories of how firms might grow within a market, how, how they might build market share within markets. So one thing that they could be doing is they could be sliding down their demand curve by reducing prices and markets. Um, Another thing that they might be doing is they might be shifting demand. And there are two sort of potential theories out there for how they might shift demand. So one theory is that, you know, firms charge uh, low markups in the beginning to grab customers. And then once the customers are buying their product, they're in some sense locked in, and then the firms can raise their markups. Um, an alternative theory uh, is that firms engage in non-price actions, such as marketing and advertising, to shift their demand. And so what we want to do here is exploit the market dimension of the data to distinguish between these uh, theories. So in this analysis, rather than using firms, we're going to be using uh, brands and products. And there's a reason why we're doing this. We want to be able to match to advertising, which is done at the brand and product level. And uh, we want to compare units and prices um, across uh, 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 different, uh, you know, brands um, and using brands and products using, using um, sorry, across different uh, brands, we need to do that within the product. So, you know, I, let's say yogurt is sold by the ounce and milk is sold by the gallon. Um, so we can only make comparisons of, of prices sort of within yogurt and within milk. So we aggregate to the uh, brand, product, and market level, and we use uh, the, that data on values and quantities to construct um, what we're going to refer to as prices, but they're basically unit values. They're going to be an average uh, price paid um, at the brand, product, um, uh, market level uh, within a given year. Okay, so now how are we going to be exploiting the market dimension of the data to distinguish between theories? We're going to make our identifying assumption is going to be that for a given brand and product, the marginal cost is the same for all the markets, all the DMAs um, that this uh, brand product is sold in, uh, sort of within a given year. So uh, you can see this equation here. Think about um, uh, the price of 
uh, Chobani yogurt in uh, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. Okay. There is going to be a, a marginal cost, which we're assuming is the marginal cost of producing Chobani uh, uh, yogurt. We're going to be assuming that that marginal cost is the same whether Chobani yogurt is sold in Minneapolis St. Paul or in New York. There's going to be a manufacturer's markup, which we're allowing to be uh, uh, to vary at the level of the brand, the product, and the market. So Chobani could have a different manufacturer markup in sales to uh, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul than in sales to uh, uh, New York. Uh, there's also a transportation cost. I don't know where um, Chobani yogurt is uh, produced. Um, so that transportation cost could vary uh, between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And then there's also a retail margin um, where, you know, the type of stores that uh, Chobani may sell in in New York may have a different retail margin. Maybe there are higher costs of uh, doing retail in New York where space is, uh, uh, retail space is expensive uh, than in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and maybe as a result, uh, you know, retail margins are different across uh, uh, different markets. This is also allowed to vary, you know, between yogurt and, you know, shelf stable uh, types, types of uh, products. Okay, so that's how we want to sort of uh, think about this. Um, and, you know, we're going to take out um, variation uh, that's specific to uh, Chobani yogurt. Uh, by using sort of comparing across different markets where Chobani yogurt is sold. And under our identifying assumption, this takes out the marginal cost part. And then the residual is going to be a combination of the manufacturer markup, transportation costs, and the retail margin. Okay, so that's how we're going to be exploiting the market dimension of the data. So yeah, next slide. So what do we do? We regress the log of the quantity of Chobani yogurt sold in, in Minneapolis St. Paul on uh, a Chobani yogurt uh, fixed effect and on a yogurt Minneapolis fixed effect. Okay, so those two fixed effects, the first one takes out this sort of marginal cost component that Chobani yogurt is just a, uh, you know, let's say produced at low cost and is a great product. So everybody everywhere demands a lot of Chobani yogurt. So we take that out. Um, we also take out the fact that maybe, I don't know, people in the Midwest like dairy products more than people in New York. And so the dairy market is sort of bigger in Minneapolis, St. Paul than it is uh, in New York. Uh, we take that out. And then we regress on the similar vector of uh, indicators for duration and tenure interacted as we did in the case of the firm, except here, these are specific to the particular market. And we do the same thing uh, for prices. So for prices, again, we take out um, a, sort of a, a fixed effect, a Chobani yogurt fixed effect. You know, this is the marginal cost of producing Chobani yogurt. And then we take out a, a sort of a market uh, Chobani uh, fixed effect, uh, sort of a market yogurt fixed effect. So, you know, maybe it's more expensive to sell yogurt in New York where it's, it's just really expensive to have freezers because they those take up a lot of space. So we take that out and again, the same vector of indicators. And so these two pictures on the bottom on the left quantity and on the right price uh, show you um, what happens when we take the exponential of these uh, beta coefficients. So on the left hand side for quantity, uh, you can see that, you know, taking out. Uh, so again, this is focusing within uh, a, a brand, so within Chobani, comparing across different markets that Chobani sells in, taking out the fact that there are, you know, different sizes of different markets, we can see that, you know, on the uh, x-axis tenure, on the y-axis uh, quantity, that uh, uh, in markets where Chobani ends up sticking around for a long time, initially it sells more than in markets where it doesn't stick around for a long time. And we also see that uh, in those markets where it sticks around for a long time, it sales after four years, uh, conditional and lasting for at least five years in those markets is three times the sales on entry. Okay. Uh, then on the price side, uh, we can see that really there's not a whole lot of action. So uh, prices on entry don't tell you 
you know, they're not systematically related to um, uh, uh, how long a product lasts in a market. And we don't see any price dynamics. Okay, so again, we're taking out the marginal cost part. So what's left is a combination of, you know, this, this uh, transportation cost, uh, the retailer margin and the manufacturer markup. And overall, we don't see any dynamics in the combination uh, of those three. Now, what we take away from this is that it's likely that, you know, uh, manufacturers are not playing around with their markups in order to uh, uh, grab customers. Uh, that if we thought that they were playing around with their markups, we would likely see that uh, sort of low, so there are two ways they could be doing that. They could be sliding down their demand curve, in which case we would expect to see, um, uh, you know, markups falling in the longest spells, or they could be, you know, charging low markups on entry to grab customers and uh, then raising them as the customers are locked in, we'd expect to see sort of an increasing markup uh, in the longest spells. And we see neither of those. You know, potentially there could be offsetting stuff going on between retailers and um, manufacturers, but we think that this is unlikely, um, given the sort of the fact that this is really a flat picture, um, which is very precisely estimated. Okay, so uh, what we take away from this is that uh, uh, you know, there are big shifts in demand. We see big, big movements in quantities uh, in, in the successful markets, the markets where firms stick around, but we see no action whatsoever in prices. So it's likely that demand is shifting. We're not moving down a demand curve. And it's likely that this demand is shifting through non-price actions rather than through price actions of the firm, okay? One thing just that's worth mentioning here is that you know, one story you could think of is that I see other people buy the product and as a result, you know, I want to buy the product. If that's the mechanism that's going on, uh, that would give the firm the incentive to charge low prices on entry because then more people buy the product. And then since more people see the product, more people are going to buy it in the future. So the fact that, you know, we don't see this increasing path of, of, of prices suggests that that's not what's going on. So next slide. We've done a whole bunch of robustness on this. So we show the same facts hold in the uh, Nielsen household panel. Um, we see the same facts in this IRI data. Um, we see, you know, a similar pattern when we use chains, retail chains, instead of uh, these uh, DMAs, these uh, uh, sort of geographical media markets. Um, so this pattern seems pretty robust. It's also incidentally exactly the same pattern um, uh, in this paper that I have using customs data uh, that we saw. But again, you know, uh, uh, we see big movements in market shares, uh, but we don't see action uh, in prices. Um, uh, one thing that I think is worth noting here as regards the Nielsen household panel is that uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, this growth in market share in the successful spells comes about, um, uh, and the successful markets comes about partially uh, through in an increasing number of customers. Uh, and so more consumers and partially um, uh, through an increase in sales per consumer, but it's mainly sort of on the number of consumers uh, side. Okay, so. Have you looked at a heterogeneity of that across like different degrees of substitutability of these goods? Like maybe some differentiated good, uh, there's gonna be more scope for, for the story about markups where it's more, you know, homogenous goods, it's, it's less likely for that to be the case. Yeah, that's something that uh, we should, uh, uh, we should look at. We haven't gone too much into the sort of cross uh, product heterogeneity. We've run a bunch of these at the product level, but to be honest, I haven't, you know, looked at that, those uh, pictures systematically. Um, in the customs data in this other paper, you know, we split by um, uh, sort of the standard measures of, of differentiation. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of difference, but uh, yeah, uh, there wasn't a lot of undifferentiated products in the sample I was looking at, yeah. so I don't have much to say there. But that that's looking digging more into the heterogeneity is definitely something that uh, you know that's a good suggestion. That's something we should do. Okay, so to sum up here, um, uh, you know, entering firms uh, build market share in their continuing markets, and they do so without 
Um, I'm not going to say that without changing their markups. I mean, that's based on the fact that we just don't see any price uh, dynamics. Um, you know, we see big growth in market shares, um, but it doesn't look like they're sliding down demand curves. It doesn't look like they're using low markups to attract customers. Um, so demand must be shifting for some other reason. Um, what might those other non-price reasons be? So marketing activity, um, you know, reaching out to stores, placing products in stores. Um, that's something um, that firms might be doing. Advertising is another way uh, that firms might be uh, uh, attracting customers. So um, the third fact, we're going to look at how firms use advertising to generate sales uh, within markets because we have these data uh, which allows us uh, to look at the advertising margin. We would love to look at marketing as well, but you know, beyond looking at the number of stores, which you know does play a big role in 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 uh, firm growth, we don't actually have data on you know expenditures on marketing, which would allow us um, to look at that at the market level. So now, uh, I'm gonna... just, yep. Just get quick question. So, are we thinking about like growing markets, or mm -hmm. is is there a difference between if whether the market is growing as a whole or you are competing to steal customers from from other you know competitors? Is there like a okay? So you're you're asking whether these guys are stealing market share from other other firms or whether they're sort of creating markets where markets didn't exist. Before. Yeah, yeah, I was exactly. Yeah, so my, my question is whether this price story, the markup story, where that holds in general, or is there a difference where, uh, if you know the market is growing? I mean, you might think that you could be more aggressive in prices okay. and markups if you're trying to steal customers, right? So I, I'm still like, um, you know, okay. whether this okay. is like a general yeah. result or. Yeah. That is, okay, so that is something that, uh, that's a, sort of a very interesting question as to say, would, if there was a more novel product compared to just a new, a new entrant within an old product category, whether this looks different. Um, so for example, Chobani, sort of the Greek, mar Greek yogurt market, that was in some sense a, a new product that didn't exist before, which maybe brought new consumers into yogurt that didn't purchase yogurt before. Um, whereas, you know, if I'm just having a, sort of a, a new type of Greek yogurt, once that market has been established, it might look different. That's something that we could look at. Um, we haven't looked at it uh, so far. Um, yeah. Whether the novelty of the product affects sort of these trajectories. Okay, so now. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. um, I have a question uh, regarding what's the difference that you're using in the definition of marketing and ad advertisement? So, uh, okay, what do I think about advertising? Adver advertising is something that's direct to consumers. Um, so, you know, putting ads on TV, putting ads in the newspaper, sticking up billboards, handing out flyers, that kind of thing. I think of marketing as I have my people call people, you know, I'm Chobani, I want to place the, pro the product in Whole Foods. I have to, you know, call up Whole Foods. I have to call up um, uh, uh, Walmart. I need to convince them that my product is going to sell. I need to convince them that they need to give up valuable shelf space from, you know, take it away from other well-selling products and give it to my product. Um, that's not direct to the consumer and it's something that I don't uh, directly observe. I don't. I don't think of these things as as sort of distinct categories in terms of you know the firm. These are actions that the firm can take that shift demand that are not that in a way that doesn't work through prices. Um, and I only separate them out because I see advertising, whereas I don't see marketing. I think of these as complementary activities of the firm, and I'll show you some evidence that these activities probably are complementary. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, now I move on to the third fact that firms use advertising uh, to uh, sort of shift demand. So here are some facts on local TV advertising by entering firms. So we categorize entrants by how many years they survive. Um, and this is looking across all markets um, that these firms might, might advertise in on local TV. 
And just look at the first line. You can see that the share of uh, firms in each category that are advertising, that this is sort of monotonically increasing in survival. So that this, this positive relationship that the guys who end up lasting a long time are much more likely to advertise in their entry year than the guys who stick, you know, don't stick around. Um, so um, I show, show you this fact to sort of say, not that there's anything causal going on with advertising, but that there is this uh, relationship with this, this, this positive association between sort of good firms, good firms are firms that stick around and, and uh, uh, the propensity to advertise. Um, these firms don't advertise in all the markets that they sell in. They, you know, you can see just the number of markets that they sell in and the number of markets they advertise in, they're advertising in a subset of those markets. Um, and then, you know, one fact that you don't see here is that advertising tends to be persistent. So maybe 60% take these, these guys who survive, survive at least five years, um, you know, they advertise in maybe 60% of the years um, that they're in the sample. So this advertising is, is, is pretty persistent. So those are sort of some, you know, summary statistics at the firm level. Now, we move on and we want to sort of relate uh, sales um, and prices at the market level to advertising at the market level. So next slide. So what we want to do is we want to estimate impulse responses of quantity and prices to uh, advertising. Um, to sort of show some moments of the joint distribution of quantities, prices and advertising. So the way we do this is by running these local projection Jordan regressions, and some of you may be familiar with these. Basically, um, we uh, take quantities uh, sold, uh, let's say, uh, Chobani selling in, in, in New York. Um, we uh, regress the log of quantities of Chobani sold in New York on a Chobani New York fixed effect. So there's some just sort of uh, you know, how attractive um, uh, New York is for uh, Chobani, sort of some average level of sales in that market and some average level of advertising in that market. Um, and then there's also some, we regress on a, sort of a, a, a New York yogurt uh, a fixed effect to take out the fact, a New York yogurt time fixed effect so that the size of the yogurt market may be varying over time in New York. And then uh, we regress uh, uh, this uh, log of quantities on an indicator um, for advertising by Chobani in that particular market. And so this little index S um, goes between uh, minus two and plus two. So we think about how much quantities am I selling, you know, two periods before I advertise, in the period that I advert, uh, in the period before I advertise, in the period that I do advertise when S is equal to zero, uh, in the period after I advertise and uh, in two periods after I advertise. Where basically we're looking at deviations of advertising from the average amount of advertising in this market. Okay, so this is uh, identifying impulse responses off of deviations uh, from uh, uh, the, the average uh, uh, advertising. Um, so we do the same for quantities and for prices and on the uh, picture in the bottom on the X axis, uh, we have this uh, S. So minus two is two periods before the advertising. Minus one is one period before the advertising. Zero is contemporaneous. And then one and two are one and two periods sort of after um, the advertising. And on the uh, uh, Y axis, we have this uh, beta uh, coefficient. So the coefficient on the indicator for whether uh, there's advertising or not. And so what you can see, first of all, is that prices and advertising don't seem to be related at all. Um, and second of all, uh, quantities um, are positively related to advertising. So going from no advertising to some advertising leads to a, a 38 log point increase in sales in the period in which, in the year in which that advertising is done, which is a pretty big uh, bump in sales. Um, so it appears that, you know, 
quantities and advertising are positively correlated um, without much action in the leads and lags, um, but in the period in, in which the advert, the year in which the advertising is done, uh, we see this bump in sales. Um, some sort of facts, other facts to note here, maybe you can uh, click on the button for stores. Uh, so you can see here that uh, uh, here we use the uh, uh, number of stores and the average value per store. You can see that the number of stores um, is sort of also related, the, both the value per store and the number of stores are positively related to advertising, but the uh, response of the number of stores is, is more persistent. I show you this to sort of uh, see, this is our evidence that there's sort of the marketing efforts, so the number of stores and the advertising effort, efforts are positively uh, correlated. We go back. Um, we also uh, use the retail, uh, sorry, sorry, the household panel um, uh, data. So click on the customers button uh, to uh, show you that the impact of advertising is more on the number of customers than on the expenditure, the average expenditure of a given customer. So this uh, uh, advertising seems to be sort of grabbing new customers um, uh, rather than inducing uh, existing customers uh, to purchase more. So go back. Uh, so uh, basically, we 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 when we're matching up this uh, advertising uh, data at the level of the brand. Uh, the product and the market, we see a positive relationship uh, between advertising and sales that doesn't seem to work uh, through prices. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Yep. Could you quickly show the incumbents results? Yep. Just to, please. So the red line here is the entrance, so firms that enter in the sample, and the blue line is for incumbents, and we see a much bigger response for entrants than for incumbents. Okay. okay, thank you. Sort of the literature on advertising suggests that the impact of advertising is not particularly big on sales, um, but uh, uh, we sort of show that if you focus on entrants in particular, that we do see big responses. Okay, so next slide. Sorry, so, yeah. so I guess in that fact, you could check whether that's sort of driven by business stealing or expansion of the market. We, no, we could, we could totally look on at other, yeah. on other yeah. brands within the yeah. same market, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we looked at sort of what happens to uh, competitors in response to my advertising. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing to know about these guys is these are entrants and in general, they're small. Um, but uh, that's that's a really great uh, suggestion. Okay, next slide. Um, so to sum up, you know, in terms of advertising, uh, we show that uh, you know advertising is cor positively correlated with survival within markets. You know, quantity responds positively to uh, uh, advertising. We don't see price responses, and something I didn't show you, but you know. Advertising appears to be correlated across different media. So I, I don't want you to think that this, you know, 38 log point increase in quantities is a causal impact of TV advertising only. These guys are, you know, advertising, uh, you know, on, in a bunch of different media. And they're also, and as I showed you, entering stores simultaneously. So they're engaging in a range of different activities to expand their sales um, uh, simultaneously. A range of sort of these non-price activities. Okay. So that's basically the reduced form analysis. Now I'm going to move on to the structural model. Uh, so the goal of our structural model, we have two goals, but we, you know, this is this is at this point sort of a proof of concept where, where we haven't quite finished with this. Um, so we only sort of get to the first goal. Um, so we want to know what's the contribution of variation in intrinsic appeal across firms to the variance of firm size. So intrinsic differences. Um, how much do they explain uh, uh, differences in firm size? Or, you know, if there's a sort of a, how, how, given how different sort of firms are intrinsically, how does that map into uh, differences in size? And then later on, we want to get to the contribution of endogenous demand uh, to, to firm growth, but we haven't quite got there yet. So 
we have a parsimonious model with predictions about a number of the target, a number of targets, which are basically the facts um, that we we have, you know, just documented. So, um, you know, targets for our model are going to be to match the evolution of number of markets per firm. Uh, we want to match the evolution of market shares and markups within firms and markets. And then I didn't show you exit patterns, but we also want to match those. And then we're going to use these impulse responses of quantity and prices to advertising as non-targeted moments. So before jumping into the model, I just want to give you an overview of uh, what this what this model is. So a model is going to be, uh, a, or sorry, a firm in this model is going to be basically a demand type. How intrinsically appealing is my product? You can think about that as something to do with uh, you know, in, in trade, people talk about quality. Um, so this appeal is something like this quality. There's just, there are products that people like and there's products that, you know, people uh, don't like so much. And that's the same uh, across uh, all markets. And so the firm is this, is this, is this type. And then firms, you know, have access potentially to uh, a range of different markets. So everybody has access in principle to the same set of markets. Uh, but in order to get into a market, you need to pay a sunk cost and a fixed cost. So first of all, a sunk cost of entry, and then every period that you sell in that market, uh, you need to pay a fixed cost. And you can think about these sunk and fixed costs as sort of like traffic lights. So there's, you know, the traffic light for a particular market can be red. You don't get to enter that market in this period. But then randomly, the light may become orange. You get to enter that market if you pay a cost. Or green, you get to enter that market for free. Okay, um, then we have this traffic light, which is, um, do I, uh, how much does it cost me to continue to sell in that market? That can be red, boom, I get kicked out of that market. It can be orange, I need to pay a cost to stick around in that market, or green, I can stick around in that, in that market for free. And then within individual markets, uh, firms are going to invest in customer capital. So they're going to have some costly um, uh, 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 investment in something which, you know, you can think about it as advertising or marketing or combination of the two, which shifts their demand um, conditional on their price. So this is sort of like a, a dynamic generalization of uh, Archilochus 2010 for people from the uh, trade literature. So next slide. So the key uh, sort of thing of this model, which is a partial equilibrium model, we're thinking about entrance, um, who are monopolistically competitive, there's no strategic interactions, they're small, um, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, the key thing for these, these guys is their um, uh, demand. So think about firm I in market K at time T. So it faces a demand which uh, is composed of, first of all, uh, the market size, so the size of market K. And the size of market K is basically, you know, how many consumers are there out there in market K. There are big markets like New York and there are small markets like uh, Northern Maine. Uh, then the second component of their demand is this chi I, which is the firm's uh, exogenous appeal or type. Okay, so there, uh, you know, Chobani yogurt, which is great. And then there's, I don't know, for argument's sake, Nusa yogurt, which nobody likes. Um, and that's, this, that's true across all markets that firm I might sell in. And this exogenous appeal is uh, uh, drawn from a, a log normal distribution with, uh, 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 with um, a, a, a standard deviation. Um, then obviously the firm's demand depends on its own price, the price, and it's allowed to price discriminate across markets. Um, you know, these firms are selling consumer food, markets are segmented from the consumer perspective in principle. Uh, uh, price discrimination across markets is possible. Um, the next term in their demand is this D uh, to the power of alpha. So D is uh, their customer base, which shifts their demand conditional on price. And we think about this as having there's some decreasing returns. So alpha is between zero and one. So I, this is D is gonna be something the firm can accumulate that's market specific, that shifts their demand and that there are decreasing returns to accumulating this. And then finally, there are some idiosyncratic uh, demand uh, terms at the firm and the market level. There's a permanent uh, idiosyncratic demand term, and then there's an IID 
idiosyncratic demand term, which induces some randomness uh, uh, across markets. So it could be that, you know, maybe uh, Nusa yogurt, on average, people don't like it, but, you know, in one particular market, uh, they love it. Um, and so that's captured by having a high, a high new uh, in that particular market. And again, these are things which we assume to be, um, there's kind of a log normal distribution playing out there. Uh, so, so, yes. Just get a quick question. So I was wondering about the uh, sunk costs mm -hmm. at the uh, market level. Mm -hmm. So do you observe in the data, like, um, you know, firms with short spells, like entering and exiting markets? Um, I was wondering about like, where is appropriate to have like a sunk cost at the market level? So we do see some uh, entry and re-entry um, at the market level. Um, that can be accommodated by this model. We are going to have stochastic sunk costs. There's this traffic light that's going on and off, which would allow this process to happen. And um, we also have these IID demand terms. You might want to enter in some periods, but not in others. Um, we're not going to be actually using this re-entry margin to identify any of the parameters in the model right now, but that's definitely something we could do. Um, so uh, to go back to this, uh, how this endogenous customer base is accumulated. So suppose uh, let X be an indicator variable for participation. Okay, so suppose X is equal to zero or xt minus one is equal to zero. So this is, think about um, uh, Chobani, it didn't sell in New York uh, in 2006. Um, we're assuming that it sort of receives a share of the New York market exogenously um, uh, uh, when it enters, okay? Um, so that sort of initializes their, their customer base. Everybody gets the same share in their uh, initial year. Uh, or in their initial period of entry, because we're going to have this actually be a six month uh, uh, model. And then if I was in the market in the previous year, so if X T minus one is equal to one, then I basically, it's just like a standard capital accumulation. I have the depreciated value of my lagged uh, customer base. So one minus Delta times D plus whatever advertising I did in the previous year, marketing or advertising effort that uh, uh, sort of incremented my customer base. Um, and then we're going to assume that there are uh, costs. There may be uh, sort of a, a quadratic cost of uh, uh, adjustment in this uh, marketing and advertising uh, expenditures. So now to get into the sort of marginal costs and uh, uh, sunk and fixed costs. We're, to keep things simple here, we're gonna load all the cross-firm heterogeneity on appeal and not have any heterogeneity in costs. We're, gonna, we're hoping to relax that, um, you know, introduce some more moments and allow for both costs and appeal heterogeneity uh, uh, as, we, as we work on this. But for the moment, we just set everybody's marginal costs the same. Um, then as regards these uh, idiosyncratic uh, sort of traffic lights for sunk costs of participating, you know, you can either have a zero sunk cost, you can have a positive but finite sunk cost, or you can have an infinite sunk cost, in which case the traffic light is red and you don't get to enter that market. And then there are also um, uh, fixed costs, which have sort of the same, uh, uh, the same form, but you need to pay them uh, every period. So I'm highlighting in blue all the parameters that uh, we're going to be estimating um, uh, when we estimate this model. Then finally, you know, in this model, a firm is just an appeal type. We don't have any uh, sort of existence decision. We don't have any entry decision of the firm. It's purely sort of a firm decision problem conditional on uh, entry, but we do, and our reason for setting it up like that is then we don't want to have to computationally set up a loop and tie all the markets together. That would sort of be uh, uh, add an extra uh, uh, computational complexity to the problem. So, uh, but we do want to capture the fact that, you know, firms that are bad um, may be more likely to exit because there's some sort of a fixed cost of, or uh, fixed or, uh, cost of production. So we allow for the probability uh, that the firm dies to depend on its appeal type. So, uh, uh, hello. Yeah, so uh, one question about, I mean, the, the previous slide, you kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, suppose like you take demand that's given and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that suggests like a small firm. Exactly. Uh, 
the assumption. But yeah. in the beginning, you you show that I don't know the number, but like six percent of the brands advertise, and that's mm -hmm. about like fifty percent of the product. So it seems mm -hmm. like the the firms that are in this game are mm -hmm. mostly big firms that should take in account the and the competition, what the competition does, and the competition affects them because I don't know. Apparently, it's small firms that will be like what you're targeting in your model it doesn't seems to 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 advertise on tv so i just i did show a a, a table for a entrance so on average entrants are very unlikely to advertise on tv but entrance entrants that survive for at least five years uh, uh 12 and a half percent of those uh, advertise on tv in their entry year so they tend to enter small um you know we can do some robustness on that you know restricting you know the sort of total market share only allowing uh guys who really are small to enter into uh, uh the moments that we look at but the moments that we're looking at are basically only for entrants they're not for incumbents and so this is a model of entry designed to match moments for entrants this is not a model which you know most of the guys who are advertising on TV, for sure, they're incumbents, and this is not a model of that. Um, this is a model of entrance. Advertising on TV and undertaking other types of activities like uh, uh, adding stores, um, uh, uh, other uh, sort of cheap forms of advertising, which we don't observe, um, it's a model of that. So. Mm -hmm. I agree that you know this is not a model of big guys and strategic interactions, and that's why we restrict our attention to moments for entrance when we estimate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and the other question is like, mm -hmm. um, that this would I don't know if it's related to the size, but but how, if, if this applies to like online advertising that is mostly you pay per click, mm -hmm. so it's mostly like a marginal cost mm -hmm. of advertising more than a fixed cost, and if that will change something within the model? Uh, then I think we would have to think about it again. So we're, again, not we're not applying it to those kinds of activities. This is, we're thinking about activities um, like TV advertising, like placing your product in stores where, you know, you sort of pay upfront to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the demand is what the demand is after that. Okay. I mean, I just wonder if it, it will change something. but. Ah, uh, and that's something I'd have to think about as to exactly how we're modeling the the advertising process here. We're, we're, right now, this is just taking an Arkalaka style thing and making it dynamic. It's there's not. It, it's a bit mechanical, um, as you'll see. It can sort of match uh, a bunch of moments in the data. Um, but yeah, we'd we'd have to think whether other technologies of reaching customers might we might want to think about those differently. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, sorry, yeah. Dorian, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so the solution to this model, the sort of really only interesting thing that you need to notice is that the optimal price here is fixed. And so we're going to hardwire it in that we get these fixed markups um, uh, that we see in the data. We're hardwiring that into the model. There's nothing sort of magic about how we fit the, the price facts. Um, and then there's a dynamic program and we solve the dynamic program. Um, next slide. Um, you know, Sorry. We, yes. In, in that solution, so, so the firm does not have this issue, like this combinatorial issue that, you know, if it chooses to enter into a, into a market that is nearby the other, that can sort of still uh, cannibalize within the firm, the sales, uh, and all of those issues that, you know, the IO literature and trade has thought about? No, so this is thinking about different markets are different, they're separate problems. The only thing that ties them together is that there's a common appeal. That's the only thing that ties them together. And then within a market, we do have these decreasing returns to advertising. Um, you know, as I, the more I advertise, um, uh, this D to the alpha, where alpha is less than one, uh, so we have these decreasing returns within a market, but that's basically the only two things. And those, so the markets are not tied together, and we have these decreasing returns within a market. It's a pretty mechanical uh, problem. 
Um, so we, I guess the one thing to know about that's I think important about estimating the model is that we um, do it at a six month level and then aggregate to annual um, because, you know, in the data firms may enter a market, not necessarily always in January, they may enter at any time during the year and we want to sort of uh, capture, capture that, uh, the impact of that on our moments. And we do so by having uh, two periods within a year. So next slide. I just want to show you um, in the last five minutes quickly the you know, the model has a good fit. These are uh, in the dotted lines, the data that I showed you, um, the pictures for quantity and price. We run the same uh, regression in the model generated data as we do in the actual data. Um, the solid line is the fit of the model. So you can see it does a pretty good job. Um, we next slide. Um, we right now, as it is, this model is still um, is still a bit of a proof of concept thing going on. We're not doing such a great job uh, of uh, fitting the uh, 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 number of markets. Uh, so again, the dotted lines are the data. The solid lines are the model. We're not doing such a great job uh, there. We get this sort of increasing uh, uh, number of markets as the firm uh, uh, ages. And we get this sort of dispersion in the number of markets on entry, but there's still some uh, wrinkles to be ironed out. Um, but you know, we'll still proceed with this proof of concept and show you, you know, what are the things that we would show you and how well do they do? Maybe we're not quite there yet, but this is what we want to do. We want to use the non as a non-target moment, a non-targeted moment, the impulse responses of quantity and price to advertising. So on the left, you can see the same data picture that I showed you, and then. Uh, we run the same regressions, uh, the same uh, sort of Georgia local projections in the model generated data as in the actual data. And you can see um, that at least the sort of uh, form of the picture uh, looks uh, similar, um, though the magnitude in the model right now is twice the response in, in the data. Um, so again, looks like the there's something going on that looks that looks reasonable in the model. Uh, we're not we're not exactly there yet. So next slide. So finally, you know, what do we want to do with this model once we've estimated it? The first thing that we want to do is we want to think about what is, you know, we've estimated, we use this model to estimate the variance of exogenous appeal. So this is this kind of underlying firm type. Again, we've loaded it all on appeal or quality. We could have loaded it all on costs um, uh, that would have different implications for prices, but right now we're not uh, looking at comparing prices across uh, firms. So that sort of doesn't matter. Um, given that assumption, the revenue of firm I in the model uh, is equal to its appeal, this chi I, times uh, this other term, which sums up um, its sales um, across different markets. So it depends on how much it's selling uh, in individual markets and how many markets it's selling in. So there's both uh, uh, terms that are based on decisions. So this NIT and the DIKT, those are decisions that the firm makes, uh, 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 takes actions. And then there's some randomness, which is generated by idiosyncratic demand and this uh, sort of traffic light uh, sunk and fixed costs, which nevertheless generate a sort of a selection uh, of who enters where um, uh, in, in, in the, uh, across the different uh, markets. So overall, then we can write uh, the revenue of firm I as its uh, fundamental type, it's chi I times this other term. So take logs of that and then do a variance uh, decomposition. So how, uh, what is the uh, share uh, uh, in the variance of revenue of this uh, fundamental uh, 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 sort of heterogeneity in appeal? So in on entry, um, that accounts for 17% of the variance of revenue. So what that says is the variance of revenue is six times the variance of uh, the underlying appeal on entry. Um, we also have this covariance term, which captures to some extent the fact that firms in the model who are good, so firms that have a high sort of uh, appeal are also entering a lot of markets and are investing in uh, uh, acquiring customer base in those markets. So we have this positive correlation uh, between underlying appeal and this remainder of the demand term 
and then there's uh, sort of uh, the variance of the remainder term. And as the firm ages, we see that the contribution of the underlying uh, variance to the total variance of revenue goes down, uh, whereas the covariance term, uh, that contribution goes up. So as firms age, uh, we get sort of that the, 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 the good firms are, are you know, entering more markets and are uh, acquiring more customers in those markets. And that has a bigger contribution uh, to the variance of revenue uh, after four years than in the uh, year of entry. So that's as far as we've got um, with respect to taking things out of the model, because you know, what we want to do is to make this firm type time varying, um, and that will allow us to think about contributions to growth that are due to uh, uh, sort of underlying heterogeneity, which evolves uh, according to some process, uh, versus the endogenous uh, response of uh, you know, actions to acquire demand. Uh, to that uh, process, but you know we haven't got there yet. So next slide. Uh, to conclude, uh, we show that you know entering firms grow by adding new markets, by melding market share uh, in their continuing markets without changing their markups. So using non-price actions, and we show an example of a non-price action that appears to be, which is advertising, which appears to be associated uh, with uh, uh, sort of generating sales and shifting demand within markets, and then. We have a model of this uh, uh, sort of these three facts uh, where you know we can back, use the model to back out uh, underlying heterogeneity across firms. Uh, we find that demand frictions magnify cross firm differences. And what we would like to do next is to use this model to uh, back out what is the contribution of endogenous demand uh, compared to sort of this uh, exogenous process for heterogeneity uh, to the growth process of firms. So yeah. Uh, thank you, Darian. We are right on time. I don't know if there are uh, any uh, additional questions. Okay. Uh, um, I can I can make a small question, maybe. Yeah, please. Um, so, do you think there's something else you could do in terms of um, like the same way as as in trade, people have thought about export promotion policies? Uh, to think about, you know, domestic uh, promotion policies for entering firms um, and trying to sort of um, um, sort of take care of the frictions that there is in the, the in 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 demand. So if you think that there are some frictions in the demand that, that that maybe some firms can take advantage of in terms of growing, and then maybe a a, a promotion policy could sort of help those firms overcome these uh, frictions to sort of grow more. Um, I guess, I mean, it, it takes you more into the normative mm -hmm. side of this, of this type of uh, models, but um, I wonder whether you guys are thinking about something like that. I mean, we could, one of the, I mean, things we could totally think about is that, you know, changes in the technology for reaching customers, such as somebody mentioned, you know, sort of uh, a direct to consumer advertising uh, you know, pay per click uh, on the internet. What is the role of new technologies in helping to sort of reallocate uh, demand from bad incumbent firms to uh, who've already paid some costs to uh, good new firms uh, that have not yet paid those sunk costs? And you know, what kind of technology, what the impact of those kinds of technologies would be? Um, you could also think of technologies that potentially, yeah. yeah well, that would be sort of the policy experiment that I would think about, not so much as a government intervention, but a change in t the technology for reaching customers. How would that have an impact on um, sort of the ability of good entrants to grab market share at the expense of bad incumbents and sort of to promote uh, sort of a healthy uh, uh, reallocation uh, across firms? I have a, a, another question. Um, this is not central to the story, but when you showed the map, I was wondering if there is a pattern for um, how firms grow in the sense that they all grow in uh, large cities in the East or in California, uh, and whether those firms will have a better chance than some firm in, in Iowa or... or um, yeah. I mean, this is not, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's central to, to the story you're telling, but I was just curious. 
So we, we do look at the relationship between the average size of the markets that you sell in in your entry year and your eventual survival. And so there we actually see that there's kind of this uh, associated matching that uh, good firms sell in all the markets, both the big markets and the small markets, uh, and enter in both big markets and small markets, whereas bad firms enter more, more likely to enter only big markets. Um, so the average size of the markets that a firm sells in on entry um, is negatively related to its survival. Um, and we also see that when firms, you know, are firms that are about to exit tend to leave first the small markets and then leave last the big markets. Um, right. So it's more in terms of this sort of negative associated matching that bad firms are only in good markets, but good firms are in both bad and good markets. All right. I have a final question. Mm -hmm. so, um, to what extent do you think this sort of um, applies these results and particularly the uh, markup results to the um, just to final goods um, instead of you know intermediate goods? I mean, is this a story for um, only final goods? So I think this is a story not just for final goods. And so the reason is I mentioned I had this other paper which uses customs data. Uh, for Ireland, where you know basically we have the full set of manufacturer uh, uh, merchandise exports for Ireland, it holds for Irish merchandise exports, which are primarily in intermediates and capital goods, and to a somewhat lesser extent in uh, consumer goods. Uh, and those consumer goods are not direct to consumers; that those are you know export sales where uh, uh, Kerrygold will uh, place a product in Trader Joe's. Um, so. That's what we see. We don't see the direct to consumer part. So, uh, based on uh, that evidence, and I know other people have replicated our findings uh, using French data, um, the sort of story is similar for uh, not just this is not specific to consumer food and direct to consumer sales. This is also true uh, in business to business transactions. Mm 